September 18, 1895, Booker T. Washington gives his Atlantic Compromise speech at the Cotton States Exposition in Atlanta. He urges African Americans to put aside the fight for equality and cultivate friendly relations with Southern whites while pursuing a practical education that prepares them for earning a livelihood. Political and social equality, he argues, will follow black self-reliant economic achievement. And now, although he has not uh, left out the other considerations, he is very strongly on economically educating African Americans, you know. Uh, and ironically, a lot of those principles go back to Booker T. Washington, uh, an African American who uh, we have a tendency to look at in a very limited light, uh, mostly the light that we're told to, limit, to, to look at him or in the ways that we disagree with him because he was not so much one who pushed the political and the civil rights as he did the economic and the educational. Um, but you have to understand the perspective he was coming from. Late 1800s, uh, a massive group of people who are not educated, not literate, determined, eager, but not prepared. Uh, and so he knew that at that time education was a major need and that connected with that was the need to restore a sense of pride in working with our hands. I mean, we've always worked in our hands, but it's been connected with slavery. So when you have that kind of connection, ideally you want to get away from it. But his whole thing was more toward economic development and not just vocational ed and some people have tried to limit him. But he said that African Americans had to be prepared with skills and the ability to become self-sufficient as individuals and as a community. And he did everything he could to get major funders to fund black colleges. You know, Tuskegee was just one of them. You know, he wasn't just his college. And so he was constantly on the cutting edge industry-wise, trying to see what were the needs and where, where did his students need to be trained so they could be more marketable. And to bring people like George Washington Carver, you know, one of the top black scientists or white scientists, you know, the scientist period of the day, to, the, to his college to help him kind of advise his agricultural program. Agriculture back then was like computer science is to us today. You know, that was the growing industry that was the heart of where people were and so that's where you had to be if you were on the cutting edge. And so Booker T. Washington, who also spent a little time in seminary school, um, decided he didn't want to finish, but he did go. Um, and, and who, you know, was very uh, God-fearing by his own admission, um, wanted very much for African Americans to develop uh, a sense of self-reliance, which is again goes back to the tradition of the black church being able to pool together your resources to get the things that you need as a community. Uh, because he felt that if you did that, when you talk about negotiating with other communities or for other, in other situations, you're bringing something to the table. You know, you have businessmen, you have skills, you know, you have political clout, whether you have a vote or not, was his perspective. 
And I don't think that what he wanted to say is that, we, that African Americans didn't want the vote. But what his perspective was, if you have the vote and you have uh, legal civil rights, but you have no money, you're still in trouble. So you're still uh, basically enslaved because you're limited as to what you can do. And so he said, let's go for the core of what we need, which is economic self-sufficiency, and then watch as the other doors begin to crumble behind it. So I think you know we need to be careful not to limit our leaders to uh, the profiles that are given to us, because he was a major economic force in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and a lot of what we have and have accomplished today, we owe it to him, and for his endurance and perseverance and advocating on behalf of African American needs. He is a Southern-born African American, born in Virginia educated at uh, Hampton Institute after the Civil War, is given not the liberal arts education of W.B. Du Bois, but is given an industrial education at Hampton, and believes that this kind of education is what can help the masses of black people. Um, this whole issue of the differences in educational uh, goals of Du Bois and Washington is really a difference in terms of who are you addressing? Is it the elite, talented 10th, as Du Bois felt, or as, as he would say, who need to have options in terms of um, liberal arts education, or is it the masses, as um, Booker T. Washington would say, who need to have something that will help them to survive economically, a skill that will help them to survive economically, and a work ethic because I think a part of this industrial arts education, you know, part of it says you learn a trade, excuse me, but the other part says you learn the value of work. Um, and that was what Booker T. Washington was looking at. Um, where Du Bois and Ida B. Wells pushed the idea of activism and protest, constantly demanding your rights, Booker T. Washington advocated what he called accommodation. Um, learning what was necessary in order to survive in the South. That if you're going to, to stay here, if this is where you choose to stay, then you must learn a trade that is valued by your community. You don't give up civil rights, because I think that's kind of a mistake when you think about Booker T. Washington as an Uncle Tom. Uh, he was a very complex man. And he did not give up civil rights, in essence. He just says, you know, you've got to go in a different direction for right now. And once you have become this valued member of your community, then you won't have any problem being allowed to vote or whatever. Now, Du Bois would probably say, well, they don't have to allow us to vote. We have a right to do this. So it's just a different approach to, you know, how you deal with these, this question of racism or discrimination in American society, and these men had very different approaches to it. Uh, and in questions of vote, the right to vote, Washington said constantly in public that the, the, the issue of voting is a secondary issue for African Americans, for black folks. It's a secondary issue for the Negro. Uh, the reason being is he would say uh, it's more important to get economics. It's more important to, to have money. Uh, etc. And he would couch this within a, a philosophy of that we can depend on the better element of the white South uh, to treat us well, to protect us, and so forth, because we're such a valuable labor group uh, in the South. And many found this this kind of philosophy abhorrent. Now, some agreed with it to be to be sure. Uh, Washington helped found the uh, Negro Business uh, Association, and so forth. He, did a number of things. But there are others who are very critical uh, of this philosophy, particularly W.D. Du Bois, William Edward Burkhart Du Bois, um, one of the great leaders, obviously, uh, of the period. W.D. Du Bois was born in uh, 1868, in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Um, again, he's a northerner as compared to Washington. He's a southerner. Du Bois uh, uh, attends uh, uh, Fisk University, where he does his uh, undergraduate work, and then later on, 
uh, to Harvard University, he earns his uh, PhD in, at, at Harvard. Uh, in fact, his first book, The Suppression of the African Slave Trade, is volume one in the Harvard series on Atlantic history. It's a, still a great volume. And du Bois, prolific writer. We could just talk about Du Bois' works. I mean, you know, <laughs> Souls of Black Folk, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the World in Africa, Black Reconstruction. You know, we could go on and on in his many autobiographies, Dust of Dawn, etc. Prolific, wrote poetry, novels, besides uh, the historian. Uh, his great work on, on John Brown, which was in fact an early cycle history. You could go on and on with Du Bois. But Du Bois was also not just a scholar, he was an activist. So no contradiction between uh, the, the two. And one of the things we always point to is uh, Du Bois' role as one of the founding members of the NAACP, in fact, the only black uh, um, uh, founding member of the NAACP. Uh, founded in 1909, officially chartered in 1910. And sometimes you see the NAACP give two dates. Uh, their organization is actually founded in 1909, the official charter is 1910, so in fact both dates are, are, are correct. But Du Bois looks at someone like Booker T. Washington and he's appalled because he says Washington is, is saying uh, that we don't need these rights. Uh, Washington is, is drawing our rights uh, away. Uh, du Bois would argue that you must assert yourself. You must uh, uh, claim your right to vote. If you don't stand up uh, and, and be active uh, and demand to be treated as a, as a man and as a woman, you will not be treated as such uh, in this society that he, as he understood power dynamics, power is not given, is taken. Uh, and, and so you've got two very different philosophies, both men concerned with how does the race progress how does the race move forward? Uh, one who's saying you've got to agitate, be politically active, uh, and search your rights, and another one saying, no, let's, let's work within, let's accommodate, let's be careful. The black folks are being lynched every day down here in the South, uh, and let's work uh, within, so to speak, and, and move forward uh, that way. So there's a very difference, uh, great difference of opinion uh, in the way uh, to proceed. Uh, and there are some clashes, to be sure, between uh, these, these two leaders uh, of the period. It's ironic that at one point, Booker T. Washington is actually considering Du Bois for a position at Tuskegee Institute. And for those interested in if history, you wonder what would have happened had Du Bois actually taken a job at Tuskegee, but that does not, does not happen. And in 1903, Du Bois comes out with the Souls of Black Folk. And in that book, uh, there, there are several chapters which are a scathing uh, uh, indictment of Booker T. Washington, his philosophy, Booker T. Washington's philosophy of education, which was one of industrial schooling, that blacks should learn how to work with their hands, or the head, the hand, and the heart, as, as, as uh, Booker T. Washington claimed. And Du Bois would say, uh, we need uh, much more of the, the head than we do just the, the hands. And then Du Bois would say, we need uh, black folk uh, who are doctors, and lawyers, uh, et cetera, not just those who plow fields uh, and so forth. So you have this, this clash. Washington had an interesting way once of describing it when he would hear and he would read in, in uh, Souls of Black Folk, particularly that chapter uh, of Mr. Booker T. Washington and others, where Du Bois I mean, it's point blank criticism of Washington and his philosophy and ideas. Uh, and Booker T. Washington, in response, uh, says something to this effect. He says, what would you do when you have your head in a lion's mouth? It does not make sense to antagonize the lion. That was, in a sense, Washington's response. If I have my head in the lion's mouth, do I antagonize the line? You know what he's telling us about the South, the situation. Uh, as he would tell friends, the boys would be dead in the day down here in, in, uh, in Alabama. Uh, and the boys' response to that was very simple. Fool, what are you doing with your head in the lion's mouth? Don't put your head in the lion's mouth. You avoid putting your head in the lion's mouth. Uh, so you have 
two very different uh, strategies. Du Bois was born in the North and does not come south um, until he comes to, until he's sent to this, um, to be educated at this in, in Nashville. And that's when he really is kind of put in touch with the conditions for black people in the South. Um, he is a, an educator, a, a scholar. Uh, he eventually studies at the University of Berlin, gets a degree in sociology from Harvard, writes um, these major works on urbanization, um, on racial patterns in cities, and is an activist. I mean, is a person who believed in constant protest, um, demanding of rights. Um, it becomes identified with protest movement and is one of the leading figures in the Niagara movement and the establishment of the NAACP. Now, historically, there was a big debate. W.E.B. Du Bois is well known in Souls of Black Folks. Really comes out in, in just in a very straightforward manner. I think it's, I forget which chapter it's in, but it's just read it recently. He, um, he says that John, uh, that uh, um, uh, Washington is, uh, is, he doesn't use the word sellout, but he's saying he's, it's, it's a dead end. He says, if you want to raise the, the African American population up, then you have to train leaders, which means that they have to be intellectually equal to or superior to the people that they're arguing against. And, um, and that this is where you get the notion of the talent of tenth, that Du Bois. And of course, so Du Bois was 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 one of uh, was an advocate for building up the universities, <coughs> Fisk, where he was a faculty member, Atlanta, other uh, universities been has been established with um, the support of northern white philanthropists. There's a lot of debate right now among historians about. Um, the role of philanthropy. Washington got heavy support from white uh, philanthropists in the North. Um, but they also supported the universities, and, and uh, there's evidence on both sides of that debate about the role of philanthropy, the Slater Fund, and uh, um, the General Education Board, and other. There was a whole host of efforts along those lines. Uh, so I don't think that, you, I would say now that the uh, evidence is that the white philanthropy supported a range of things uh, regarding black education in the South. Um, but it certainly uh, is uh, beyond dispute that Washington received a lot of support. And that Tuskegee probably wouldn't have succeeded in the way that it did without massive support from Northern white philanthropy. And a part of that was the feeling that this was appropriate education for African Americans. Manual training was, was really the best option. Du Bois was born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts in 1869. Uh, he was the first black PhD from Harvard, I believe he graduated in 1895. A truly extraordinary figure. He taught at Wilberforce University shortly after finishing his PhD, uh, then went on uh, eventually to teach at Atlanta University. Uh, basically determined because of, I think, the reality and the harshness of American culture and the treatment of blacks, uh, starting around 1900, but it becoming more marked as the years progressed, determined by, I believe it was 1910, that a role in the university, um, teach, remaining as a university professor, was not going to be sufficient. That the um, dealing with the questions of race and equity that he wanted to deal with, that it was really going to be necessary for him to move to a different venue. So as an enormously controversial, much respected professor at Atlanta University, he goes to the um, goes to New York, and I believe it was 1910 and um, becomes the sort of editorial head and propagandist, and he, he would use the term propagandist to describe his work, and the editor for the uh, Crisis magazine. 
And starting off on a shoestring with almost no budget, he takes the crisis from being a very minor and obscure magazine and journal within a couple of years to being the voice of uh, black thinkers and of action in America. And I think as much as um, uh, anyone operating within the NAACP is responsible for galvanizing that organization as a political action group and as one that's interested in progressive social change. Uh, du Bois, uh, to a large degree, I think, has been um, undervalued in American culture. My personal take on him, he's a great hero of mine. Um, I think perhaps one of the two or three great sociologists in American culture, regardless of race or color, certainly the great black sociologist, without doubt. Uh, a profoundly important educational thinker. I'm just in the process of completing a book on W.E.B. Du Bois as uh, educational writer and philosopher and sociologist. And it's really remarkable, um, his um, work in that area, although recognized, it's not that he hasn't, that hasn't been pointed out that he was important in that area. If you, if you go back, however, and you look at his total corpus of work in education, you find a major, major contribution. I mean, it's just year after year. Du Bois lived into his mid-90s um, and um, died the night before. I mean, it's an incredible story. But um, he'd gone into exile, essentially, um, went to live in Ghana. He received the um, uh, Award of Lenin or the Medal of Lenin from uh, Russia, the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, for his um, for his work, uh, became a Marxist, became discredited during the McCarthy era, but he dies in um, Ghana uh, the night before, in 1963, um, I believe it's the day, um, dies in the night before the um, major civil rights march on Washington, I believe the one where Martin Luther King gives his famous I Have a Dream speech, and um, Roy Wilkins uh, gets up in front of the group before the major uh, actions um, of the um, of that extraordinary meeting on the mall takes place. And he says, you know, uh, as a wonderful um, comment, something to the effect of, you know, a, a great light has passed from this earth or from this planet. Uh, last night, uh, Dr. Du Bois died in Ghana. And uh, just thinking about it, sort of just, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's very moving. Mm -hmm. And um, it's an extraordinary moment in history. But this man lived, I think, to a large degree, the extraordinary moments in um, uh, black history and American history. I mean, some of the most more extraordinary moments in this you know, vital uh, participant in, I think, uh, defining American history and uh, thought in the 20th century. And he did it as an outsider. He did it as a marginalized person in the sense of he was never accepted by mainstream American universities. He was certainly highly respected within the black community and within um, the black historic universities and colleges, although even there not without controversy. But he did it um, you know, absolutely as a marginalized and oppositional figure, um, taking extraordinary risks and um, showing extraordinary courage. Uh, he was an elitist, to be sure. Um, I think a um, awkward and diffident man in a lot of regards. Uh, uh, David Leverett Lewis has a marvelous biography on him that goes up until 1919. And I understand that the new biography has just been published that deals with the later years of his life. He won the Pulitzer Prize for it, deservedly so. It's a brilliant, brilliant book. And you really get a sense of um, Du Bois's life there. But um, this is a really important, important figure. And you know, if I were to talk about I guess on my list of the 25 most important Americans, or perhaps even the um, 10 or 15 most important Americans in our history, I would certainly put Du Bois there. So seeing him at this sort of micro level working on the exhibit of the American Negroes is you know, a real treat for me. I think one of the things that really makes um, the study of history compelling, um, I think that being able to go back and see what this man did and the sort of issues he was putting together and how he struggled to do it and, and see this marvelous work that results, this historical legacy that's of so much interest and value. It's, um, it's a real treat for me as a um, cultural
cultural theorist, historian, you know, whatever it is, I am a sociologist, um, to be able to um, reconstruct this material and, and make it more available to the public. This is a story that needs to be told. sentence. 